in an echo of a scream, two pounds of pressure to pull the trigger, a machete to make the hole bigger. One little foot forward to wake a three dollar landmine. Night, night, child of mine. Within the time for a tear to drop, to thieve a childhood, who will make it stop? Ripples of war gash upon the flesh and minds of the masses who are tangled in the volley for power galore while opportunity for peace idly passes. Idly passes. Injustices ensue in laid-back periphery of some who prefer to shield their mind and arrest a hand while coursing the center line of others who are entrapped by shrapnel or led by conscious command. But for many, who habit nonviolence and nurture by nature, they stand vigilant for the children whom war has ruthlessly hit, to nurse them back from combat as caverns of memory permit. In many countries that are in the midst of war, civilian homes, schools, camps for the internally displaced, and the roads to go back home are fraught with abiding cruelty, especially for children. The constant fear of the unpardonable tactics of military forces of the government and the sadistic insurgent Lord's Resistance Army filled the roads with 40,000 children known as night commuters. Sister Paulina Kayu works in Gulu District of northern Uganda to support implementation of peace building, conflict resolution, prevention of child abduction, and reintegration of the formerly abducted children back into their homes and communities. The night commuters are, these are children who are living either in the camps or in the villages with their, in the communities with their parents. But because of fear of abduction, they have to move every day some even more than 10 kilometers. We build what we call night commuting commuter centers, but there are not many. So you will find only a quarter of the night commuters sleep in the center. It is so cold, they get coughs, they get malaria and all sorts of sickness. They go back home. There's no, no money to bring them to the hospital. There's no medication, and that's how they end up dying. Over 60,000 children have been abducted, and actually 60,000 is very, very, that, that means covering all the Gulu district. Children are violently taken and used as sex slaves, porters, and soldiers, often forced to kill their own friends and family. The children who do escape, they don't go straight away to the camp. First of all, they are taken to the reception center to help them come out of the trauma that they, have, they are undergoing. And from the reception center, we make them undergo what we call the traditional reconciliation cleansing ceremony. After that, a community gathering celebration is made. And from there, we reintegrate them and they go to the camp and they meet with all this a lot of rape, people are drinking, and then drug addicts. You find most of them, again, get involved in just kind of thing taking place in the, in, the, in the camps. Instead of helping them to come out of the atrocity, you have to deal with, if they're involved in alcohol, we have to deal with that, in drugs. And in many cases, we make them get involved in, we have started football team, just to make them be involved in activities. We went through the local leaders in the community, in the camps, in the parishes. And then we trained them how to manage conflict in the community, in their family, and then to help others. We have formed a lot of women groups who are 
speaking out, coming, standing for 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 the women's rights, and I think that's what is helping in Uganda. As more and more women speak up and weave alliances from our global community, they're clearing the grounds for disarmament and cultivating nonviolent alternatives to conflict. However, the blood of war, even after the killing stops, seeps deep into the infrastructure of a country and the spirit of a human being. Tavari Huet's childhood instincts saved her from being slaughtered alongside the estimated 150,000 peasants in her area who did die during the 1969 to 1973 secret air bombardment of Cambodia by the United States. Sherlock and the will to survive served her again during the post-Vietnam four-year Khmer Rouge genocide known as the Killing Fields, which brutally starved, overworked, and butchered two million people, including most of Tavari's own family. Cambodia's war wounds and surplus weapon supply have torn apart many families. Clearly, Tavari, along with the rest of her country, are still picking up the pieces after three decades of war. No one was responsible for the left weapons, for too many weapons after the war, after the armed conflict. Many weapons left in the hands of the Khmer Rouge. Small weapons, portable, cheap, durable, and easily recycled from one conflict to the next, kill far more than any larger conventional weapons. An assault rifle can be used for 20 to 40 years with little maintenance. Landmines can keep themselves alive for 50 years. We received a request from the civil society to provide them capacity to work with the communities. We produce posters to explain the consequences of small arms misuse and possessions. We developed a poster to educate the communities to hand over their weapons to the local authorities without punishment, educate the armed forces to understand their roles to own weapons during the mission. In many cultures, weapons are often associated with masculinity, and men are most often the bearers of arms. This further distorts power imbalances between genders. Armed violence is frequently used to facilitate rape and sexual assault of women and girls by military forces in battle, security forces assigned guardianship, and by intimate partners in the home. While educating in classrooms and public speaking engagements, Tavari shares her experiences about a militarized culture and her own marriage to encourage women to leave violent situations. So whenever he got angry at me, he threatened me, he showed his gun under my chin, or sometimes from my back, sometimes like this, on, sometimes he shoots through the window. She's inspired by her children and her personal freedom now and embraces nonviolence. I just want to contribute. As a project officer and monitor for the Zimbabwean Election Support Network, Immaculata Chizea pushes for democratization of the electoral process, despite the onslaught of repressive laws that make her work more and more difficult. They would like go into a community and tell them that we are going to be monitoring this area. If the ruling party does not win, you people are going to suffer. We are not going to benefit from any food aid. So at the end of the day, people will then weigh between voting for the opposition or getting something for the stomach. So that's why we always call it politics of the stomach, whereby people are forced or coerced to vote for something they don't want. So the candidates would really come to the people 